Let's talk PPI. I have a little handout for PPI here. Uh, events, AFNI handouts, strategically called capital cap, all caps, PPI dot little PDF. Well, doing the hands-on stuff, handouts aren't as important. If you're doing a lecture, then of course you just follow handouts. Me, I try to ignore them as soon and as soon and completely as possible. PPI, psychophysiological interaction. So what is it? Uh, it's supposed to be the interaction between multiple tasks. So the, the, the conditions that you're um, stimulating your subjects amongst and uh, the physiology, which is, say, the bold signal. And the physiology here would be the, 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 the signal at some voxel location or at some location in the subject's brain. So you, you're looking for an interaction between, uh, you know, at every, at every voxel in the brain, you, you want to evaluate the interaction between the different tasks and this location in the brain. It's a little bit like a seed-based analysis, a seed-based resting state analysis, but you, you, you want to think about how the, the correspondence varies among the task conditions. That's basically what it is. An example of uh, what, what you might be asked here is, uh, so what is a larger component of the left auditory time series during uh, the auditorial, auditory reliable condition uh, as opposed to the visual reliable condition? So if you, if you make a, a time series in the left auditory area somewhere or an ROI average or just take a, a seed, uh, you make that time series, that's the physiology aspect of this. And then you want to see for every other location in the brain, how does, how does what has a larger or a smaller component of the, this time series, uh, how, does the, how does the contribution of that time series vary among my tasks? And here, say, among the auditory and visual reliable tasks. We like to measure this above and beyond the main task effects. If you, if you include the main task effect, this might just be a, a normal interaction in the beta weights just as compared to the beta weights at this voxel. You could do that with uh, 3D t-test plus plus if you wanted to, just use the, com not compare to zero, but compare to the, the beta weight magnitude at this location. Of course, you probably get a lot of negative results if you have a positive beta weight here. All the zeros across the brain might show something. But anyway, you, you, uh, the, the, that, that should be an easy thing to do. You don't need a fancy method to, to get such an uh, in, interaction. So we want to measure this above and, and beyond the main task effects. Let me leave this here for now and leap over to my favorite place, the terminal window. And you can come, you can come along. So let's go to the uh, home directory again. So we'll type CD and LS. And uh, I want to look at, some, look at uh, some time series to get a better idea of what PPI is going after here. So let's go back into AFNI data six and we'll stay in the FT analysis subdirectory. So this is where we just ran our surface uh, analysis scripts. Within this directory, there is a PPI directory. Okay, so let's go there. So these uh, actually read me here is, is a, an analysis script. This read me script calls these command scripts. We'll save that for later. But what, what that is, uh, is a set of scripts to run a PPI analysis based on our FT results. So we've run the, the basic volumetric results on subject FT. And so we have the FT results directory. We've done a volumetric analysis there. Maybe now we want to run a, a PPI analysis on, uh, based on that. 
So these scripts are set up to do so. But before we worry about that, uh, I want you to run this run PPI example.txt script. That's not so great to look at, but so I'm just not going to. Let's just TCSH the thing and uh, look at what it shows us. So TCSH run PPI example.txt. By the way, this is a nice projection system. This looks fantastic. We've got high resolution. We can show a lot of stuff. The, the SUMA stuff, that's, that was encouraging me to show the extra garbage in SUMA because we can see it all and, and see it well. And you don't have to stack things on top of each other. This is nice. I noticed that here, just putting these windows to the left of each other, you, you, we usually don't have the space to do such a thing. Anyway, I digress. Let me switch these around. I'm going to put uh, windows titled ideals on the left and target in the middle and seed on the right. Doesn't really matter, but that maybe is a, in order that makes more sense. So what do we have here? On the upper left here, we have two voxels. I have perhaps no idea which, which is which. Yeah, I don't remember what, what I did for this. But uh, I should be able to figure it out from here. But anyway, the blue and the purple on top, one of these, one of these time series is at, our, uh, is at a, our seed location. And one of the time series is at some random target location that we want to compare to our seed. So our, our seed location is the seed for the, it's the uh, physiological piece of the PPI. So this seed location is going to determine, we're going to compare things. We want the contribution of this seed to each target location. Uh, and we want to see how that varies across our conditions. So I don't know which is which. Let's call it the blue and the seed. Hopefully it's correct. I'm suspecting it's not, but who cares? So we've got a seed time series in blue and a target time series in, in purple. And we want to decompose these things somehow. First of all, we don't want the task main effects to affect our PPI. So the task main effects are in the, in the bottom in, blue, in, in, in black and red. Those, you recognize those curves, right? The black is the visual reliable stimulus, the ideal response curve, and the, and the red one is the, visual, is the auditory reliable ideal. So we don't want those to affect our PPI. The green here, the green here is supposed to be, it, it's, it's a sinusoid, I didn't know what else to use, but it's some, it's some function that is zero mean over time. This is what's going on in our seed region beyond beyond the task and how much of this over time might vary. So the seed re region has some amount of this over time. And then the target region has some different amount of this stuff. The target has an amount of the seed over time and, and we want to look at the contribution of the seed at the target location and for every target location in the brain, for that matter. So, so. Uh, we just want to do to the frequency of the sinusoid, it's just a guess. Uh. I, just, just to throw something in there. The point is, it has to be zero mean across all time and zero mean with respect to our tasks of interest. So I didn't know how to fake that well, so I just, just made a sinusoid have it go up and down fast enough where I figure it's about zero mean over any, any of these durations. But it doesn't have to. Let me give you a context to picture the PPI in, a better, better one than this one. So I, uh, I run an analysis where I'm comparing my two main conditions are images of puppies and images of spiders. And I'm comparing, uh, you know, the brain response to these two types of images. So I run my analysis, I 
write my paper, uh, publish my results, and you know, lo and behold, I'm in nature. There, there's a difference between looking at puppies and spiders. But I wasn't very picky. I didn't take, take uh, note of the fact that, you know, some spiders are kind of ugly, some are really cute. And the puppies, some of the puppies are okay, but some of them are really scary, right? Puppies can really scare people and spiders are adorable. So, you know, there's, there's a cuteness factor for the spiders and a scariness factor for the puppies that I haven't accounted for. So you could imagine that your subjects, they see this puppy, this puppy, this puppy, this puppy. Maybe the, the magnitude of the bold response is varying across stimulus events. Or maybe I see a lot of puppies, so I lead, see a, there are a lot of little fluctuations in the bold response based on these quick stimuli that are presented in a block condition, say. I see 10, 10 puppies at a time and their, their, their scariness factor, uh, factor goes up and down. And maybe that's actually in the data at the seed location and, or at any location. And maybe the same thing holds for the spiders. I see a, a kind of an ugly spider and an adorable spider. And you see, you know, at some different parts of the brain, you see fluctuations due to that. But you didn't account for this in your analysis. But the variance is in the data. The subject is responding to these, these, these cute spiders. So, a PPI could, could capture that because in your main analysis, all you've got are these big black and red curves. All you account for is the average bold response to the spiders and the puppies. But maybe on top of that, based on how cute these things are, you're seeing additional fluctuations that just aren't in your model. Perhaps you should be using some amplitude modulation that would be appropriate in, in the context of what I'm describing. But let, let's ignore that. And, and, and let's look at an alternate way of doing this and maybe in the context of a PPI. So that, that does bring into question, to some degree, in my mind, a PPI uh, analysis often is the only thing it can really capture is something you didn't think of capturing in your original model. Another thing you might find with a PPI analysis, the way to get a stronger PPI result is to do a lousy job in your original model. The worse you model your data up front, the more is going to be left for PPI to find. Because PPI is more of a correlation type of analysis. But you've got tasks in there and not just someone taking a nap in the, in the scanner. You know, so you've got actual tasks, which tends to mean bigger bold responses, and so you'll, you'll capture the variance of these things more in a PPI analysis than, uh, than, than in the task. So if you do a bad job up front, your PPI may be better. So, that, so that's make of it what you will. You'd rather do a good job up front. But so, so the, there are these aspects that you either don't understand or you failed to model in the data or, or what have you. And so, so that's what you're left with. So you've got these things going on. And again, the, this green signal is just some, some cuteness rating or something like that, something happening in our voxels of interest, but it's on top of the task. So like this blue curve right here, in the first, in the first graph, maybe some combination of, of these five curves. And what are these five curves? Well, the black curve of is of course the uh, uh, visual curve, or, or let's call this the uh, puppy curve, and the red curve is the spider curve. The green curve is the the typical addition, or is the additional fluctuation that isn't varying with task at our seed voxel. So it's just whatever is going on in our seed voxel that's more or less o over the whole run. And then the blue is like an additional component that's an additional fluctuation that's happening during the, now I forget, is this the spider time? So this is additional fluctuations during the spider time, and the purple is additional fluctuations during the puppy time. And the same thing at the, at the well, I've got target and seed here. I should reverse those. I'm sorry for uh, throwing you off here, but... Again, it's more logical to talk about the seed first than the target. So we've got these components in the seed and the components at the target. And so the PPI is, 
we, is how much, how much is the seed time series, how, how big a component of the seed, seed time series seems to be present in each of the target time series uh, in the different conditions. And the interaction, so you might get a beta weight for each condition. The beta weight for my uh, spiders might be the contribution of the seed that's unique to the spider condition, and a beta weight for uh, 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 puppies might be the contribution that's uh, particular to the, specific to the puppy condition. Plus, there's a, a contribution that's more or less consistent over time, a single beta weight that is the effect of the, the seed at the target location. A little bit confused? You should be. P PPI is not a, it's not a simple, obvious thing. Maybe the original way it was done, it was more or less looking at one condition, we have this magnitude, and the other condition, this magnitude. And how does, how does the difference between these compare between a seed and a target? If you only have two conditions in, in your entire time series, you can do something like that. How many people are doing analyses with two conditions? And that includes rest being one of them. So you are? So if you're doing that, maybe you could do a, more of a standard PPI, and it would be a little more comprehensible to talk about. But if you've got 17 conditions, like most people have, you, you can't do something like that. So this is more of the, uh, this, this, this should reduce to the same thing as the old PPI, but this handles multiple, more than two uh, conditions. So you'll, you'll effectively get a beta weight of the PPI value per condition, and the interaction would be, say, the difference of two of them. And the difference of two would be would show a change in contribution of your seed at the target location between condition puppy and condition spider. So effectively, uh, we, we'd like to just remove this ideal time series from the data. When you know, so the the evaluation of the PPI should not be affected by these big curves because they're, they're just going to dominate everyone, anything. You've already done that analysis. You don't need to see that same result come out in your PPI. So, so we, we basically try to make our, do the PPI orthogonal, keep the PPI uh, results orthogonal to that, or based on orthogonal curves. So how do you choose this? Do you like based on the stuff? You, you, you choose the seed in much the same way you do it in a resting state analysis, whatever the heck you care about, you know, uh, who's to say? So, you, so in this example, we said we cared about the left auditory cortex, but like you've got a region that is interesting in some way, and you think it has some connectivity with some other regions. And the, tar the target is everywhere. Each, each location becomes a target, but there's one seed location, say. So, so the, you, it, it's this area that you, you care about how this connects to everything else. Does it make sense if you do trail and like, visualize uh, on auditory and you get the highest T and take that box loss? You, you, you could, you could pick the, pick the max seed. So, uh, you, you know, the PPI results, actually also the way we've described them, they're, they're, the time series are somewhat orthogonal to the main results. So that, that should be, that in itself gives you a lot of justification for choosing the seeds however you want. But, you know, so, so that brings up a question, are your seeds going to be single subject based or group based? So there's some difference there too, but you know, for the most part, I, I don't see any reason why you would be restricted in choosing a seed, you know, because even, even the main result is, is more or less, you know, we're using time se series that are orthogonal. So it's not, it's not, quite like the double dipping thing in, in choosing a main seed and then doing a new analysis based on that. that that's not even quite double dipping either. It's sort of a, just a, a different thing. But, you know, I, I think you can justify using whatever you want. Okay. Uh, 
Here, uh, let me leap back to the slides. Is this page two? Yes. So here, uh, we are going to actually use beta weights as measures of effect. So, so basically here, we're, we're going to end up with our, the PPI beta weight is going to be not a correlation or a Z uh, normalized correlation. We're going to use a beta weight. And the beta weight is, here's my seed time series, but I've removed the main effects. Now what's the contribution, the magnitude of my seed time series during puppies versus during spiders? So it, these are beta weights, effectively. It's a magnitude of this some time series. So the incremental effect of this seed time series, say, at the other locations. So one, one, there, you could do it as a correlation analysis. However, like one example, the trouble with the correlation, if you look at the correlation of these two areas, um, suppose they're only correlated during the puppy condition and, and not the rest of it. And even suppose they're more or less perfectly correlated. The correlation value is going to be scaled, essentially scaled down by the fraction of time that they have the correlation over, over the whole thing. So if, if basically the correlation is zero during the whole run, but during 10% of it is high, your, your, your R squared, the R squared should be 10%. It won't be 100%. So it, it basically scales it down by the duration. And that's, that's a goofiness. Now, how much of my run did I use for acute spiders? How much of I, did I use for scary spiders? Is it the same? What about the puppies? And you know, how much for puppies versus spiders? You know, did I stimulate for as long? Now you have to worry about these things because they will affect the correlations but they won't affect the beta weight, assuming you have enough time to estimate the beta weights, which you should because they're during the same task conditions. So, so beta weights, you know, in, in those ways are a little easier to, to handle. And then beta weights are just done as a group analysis the same way beta weights are now. Puppies versus spiders, but now we can use PPI puppies versus spiders. So again, they're, they're a little bit more like task effects, not affected by the relative cumulative durations of them, like I mentioned. So the way we do it is we compute for all task conditions at once. So however many tasks you have, you'll compute a beta weight for the contribution during each one of these conditions, puppies, spiders, pizzas. You know, for each of your conditions, you'll con uh, you'll, can, you'll get a beta weight that shows the contribution, the relative, uh, not contribution, but the relative amount of your seed that is present at each one of your target locations. So you'll get these magnitude uh, values. And so you can do a group analysis just the same way you would otherwise do it. But, but let's, so let's, let's think about how we can how we can actually do this. How do we get these magnitudes? One, one difficulty is, so suppose my, my, uh, my puppies are displayed for 10 seconds here. And let's, let's say if we wipe out the main task effects, they're gone. So let's not even talk about them. So I see some fluctuations during the 10 seconds of my puppy response. Can I just compare those between the seed and target? That 10 second period? No. Especially, what if it's not 10 seconds? How many of your conditions are 10 seconds long? Most of you, they're, they're one second long. You're gonna compare one second to one second? Let's, let's ponder one or two seconds, actually. That, that makes it more obvious. If you compare the one or two sec, the, say two seconds to two seconds between seed and target, how do, how do they compare? Well, let's suppose we, we present a big uh, stimulus in this two seconds. The cutest spider ever seen is presented. So you expect a big result, a big bold effect of that, right? What does the bold effect look like due to that? Two seconds. What does the bold response look like? It looks like this. 
It's all over here. What's the effect in that two seconds? Nothing. There's no bold response in here almost at all. It takes two seconds for the bold response to, to get off the ground. It peaks four or five seconds later and then goes back down after 12 or 14 seconds. You're, you're nowhere near your, your stimulus period. That's the bold effect, right? This, this makes life a little more difficult. Now we have to talk about deconvolution. We have to talk ab about, say, M and I ti uh, uh, MRI timing or bold timing versus some sort of neurological timing. What really happens in the brain during the two seconds? Forget the bold response. We just want just what's happening in that two seconds, and the bold response is just an effect of it. So, so life is hard. So what do we do? Am I talking about uh, deconvolution here? So here, here we whine about the con of of the uh, task convolved with the response function. And let me just re uh, leap down to the uh, processing steps. So what what do we actually do? And maybe maybe things will make. Uh, be more clear this way. So first of all, we generate a seed time series. But again, we don't want the main effects to influence this. So where do we get this seed, seed time, time series from? Do we want motion, known motion effects to affect this? Do we want known drift to be involved in this? No. This is all just mud the waters, right? So. If we don't want any of this garbage affecting our seed time series, where might we get the seed time series from? The residuals. That's right. You get it from the, the single subject analysis residuals. You've, you've already removed the main task effects and then all the garbage things that you don't talk about. So you just get it from the residuals. Life is a little harder when you worry, worry about censoring. Let's table that aspect for now. But you get it from the residuals. So now you have a seed time series that doesn't have any main task effect. You've already regressed out the main task effect and motion and pull alerts, whatever. So you generate your uh, read, uh, seed time series uh, from an ROI average or a seed or whatever you do. You can, you can drop a sphere down or a ball down a five millimeter radius, whatever you do. And then you want to deconvolve this seed timing in some sense. So remember though, the bold response is slow and sluggish. You've, you've got a two second event. You don't want, your, you don't want the, the thing you're comparing from the two second event. You want it from the cute puppy, the cute spiders. You don't want it, want it from the pizza task that happened seconds ago. You're actually in the middle of the peak for your pizza stimulus. You don't want pizza, you want, you want spiders. So you want to deconvolve that, that the bold signal in some sense. So instead of getting this, uh, this bold curve, you get more of like a neurological magnitude, uh, which of course we can't do accurately, but we, we, can, we can hope we can more or less estimate some sort of neurological signal by deconvolving all of the MRI data all of the MRI signal with the block, the same block basis you use for your regression. So if you used BLOCK, if you used BLOCK for your main analysis, for your main regression, which we did, we used block of 20, or if we use block of two or block of seven, who cares? You're using BLOCK. If that's the, what the bold response to you look like, we can deconvolve the signal with this function, and now we have some sort of neuronal timing signal um, that we can partition over stimulus time. Fixation, pizza, puppy, spider. We can, we can break our time series into that with zeros, basically you zero out everything but your condition of interest. And now, in some sense, you have neuro, neural activity in your uh, condition during your condition of interest. Optimally, you might, you might even think right now, well, shouldn't we do all of our analysis like that? 
wouldn't we actually like to deconvolve our whole 4D time series and run our linear regression model, then, then, then we could just do the whole analysis like this. That might even be reason one if, if we could deconvolve well, and two, the, the cost is that would take a long time. Deconvolution is an expensive step. It takes a lot of computation. It's easy to do it in one voxel modestly quickly, but to do it on 100,000 uh, takes a long time. Anyway, so we take our need, uh, seed time series and partition it for this across the stimulus classes. Cla classes. Now we have one seed time series per condition. Zero everywhere, but fluctuations during our conditions of interest. Spiders, puppies. And we, we would hope that we see uh, cute spider, ugly spider. Cute, very cute spider, uh, moderately cute spider, and similarly for puppies. So we hope to see some sort of fluctuations like this. And now, now that we've partitioned this seed in this one seed time series, we have a piece of that time series per condition. Zero puppy, zero puppy, zero other puppy, zero spider, zero cute spider, medium spider. So it's all zero except during our condition of interest, and then we should see the fluctuations. Now that's, these are fluctuations that we think might be related to our stimuli because we deconvolved the signal back to neuronal timing as if that were well possible. Ho hopefully it's not grossly incorrect. And then we reconvolve that back into MRI timing. So now we, now we can reconvolve with our block, but now we've separated our puppies and our spiders in appropriate, temporally appropriate uh, uh, times. So, so what, now once you reconvolve, now you throw them in the linear regression. You put the seed in the linear regression and all your PPI terms, and now you just get beta weights out. You don't care about the beta weight from the overall seed. You want things that are specific to the condition. So you get your beta weight for puppies and your beta weight for spiders, and their difference might give you the interaction. And the final result is blaming your confusing results on literature-generated seed locations. That's, that's, the, that's the most important step. But then, Larry, you are not running your uh, PPI regressors just against the ER odds. To some degree, you could just put your, EP, uh, your uh, PPI regressors, regressors in the ERTS model, and we could almost do an insta-PPI like that in 3D Deconvolve. Except then you'll get situations uh, like gong whining at you. You're not accounting for all the degrees of freedom. It's better to pull it in the full model. So that's what we suggest. So just throw all of this back in the original model. And, and then you're accounting your, all your degrees of freedom and stuff like that. So you, you, it would be, it w and I've looked at the results. The difference between these two things, they're, they're very similar. I haven't done any extensive analysis, but I, I did a quick look. There's a, a long word source, like, I don't know why, but it's looking at the back. Second? Like the noise? Uh huh. Like, if we, some, if, like, the noise comes from the long source. It, any, any noise is going to affect this. I mean, so, so we hope that, the, uh, that our PPI beta weights are just dependent on the cuteness of the spiders. But any noise that affects your, your target is going to corrupt this. So any, anything, any, any stimulus can affect this. But that, that applies to your original analysis, too. Any, any, but then, the, then so this is, this is a difference between task and rest, too. It's a similar difference for an external stimulation to affect your ta your main task analysis, it has to be correlated with your task. The, the timing has to be somehow a little synchronized with your task. So like motion might often apply to that, but some random things probably won't. But random things can affect your whole brain at once. And that means they affect the seed and the target, and that's more of a resting state type problem. You could see resting state correlations be, because of this random thing.
So PPI can again pick up, you know, so anything in the in a similar sense that resting state can. So just to, just to note it then the uh, in this PPI directory you've got uh, again this readme.txt and command one two three. This this runs a PPI analysis. This is the this is really the, the documentation, say, that we have on how to do it. You could just modify this to suit, to, to suit your data. So that, that, that's a non-trivial thing, but I tried to make the scripts reasonably comprehensible and commented. So uh, let me just mention, to, to ge generate your seed, first you run the original uh, uh, regression, but without censoring because we don't know how to handle censoring when we're doing a deconvolution and reconvolution step. So whatever average uh, motion spikes and whatnot, uh, we figure we pass it back and forth. On the flip side, if we use the censored data, we'd probably rather deconvolve and reconvolve the zero, the censored, the zero residuals the zero values in the earths than a motion spike. But uh, you, you know, you can bicker about that. So in, in a somewhat analytically conservative way, we'll say start out by not, so your, your main analysis censored. Do another thing where you don't censor. You can just run 3D deconvolve or 3D T project actually with the same X matrix, just take out the censoring thing. So it's trivial to redo that. 3DT project to project out your original no sensor X matrix from the data. And now you have the residuals, and then you said you send your residuals to this, uh, or you do ROI average for your seed time series, and then you can send that to uh, basically the second script. Here we use 3D deconvolve. In this case, since our main basis function was like a block and not like a gam, in the, in the, since it was like a block, we run 3D deconvolve just to generate a block ideal time series. Oh, I didn't mention one little aspect here. We actually oversample the data before we do the deconvolution. Uh, the, the, the nice little addition of uh, effect of the oversampling is one we can we can handle stimulus uh, stimulus events that are not TR locked. So uh, we didn't we didn't say what we haven't talked about when the cute spiders were displayed yet, right? That might not be TR locked. Do you need one TR, two TRs, or pieces of them? What if your stimuli events half a second in the middle of TRs? Then then you have no events. So. So how we did this is we, we oversampled the timing in here down to 0.1 seconds. And now, now we can have actual blocks of time for our stimulus conditions, even if they're not TR-like. They're just locked to this 0.1 second TR now. And we, uh, so we oversampled the timing to that. We, we have the, the temporal intervals of our, of our spiders. Uh, so we can we deconvolve the time series, and now we can grab those temporal uh, spider intervals at the 0.1 second TR, and then reconvolve. And uh, one little interesting thing to note about this: the temporal, uh, if you if you oversample it like this, doing the deconvolution and then reconvolution steps, they are uh, almost inverses. So if you take your time series, you oversample it involve it like we do and reconvolve it, you get almost the same time series back. That's not uh, like other software packages may restrict themselves to bold like signals. That's a nice thing. We don't go after that. Uh, it, it's kind of nice to have this invertibility that, that gives a robustness to the method that, that is nice. So, so we're going to rely on the censoring and the motion parameters and stuff like that to work like they have been already. And we'll just let the data be what the data is and, and pass it through in the PPI filter, say, and, that, and, and hope it comes out well. Anyway, so we oversample everything to this 0.1 second grid. We make a 0.1 second resolution block response ideal. And the duration of this uh, 
block response is 0.17. Basically, uh, we're generating an instantaneous response curve with the shape of block. And then we can convolve this or deconvolve this uh, you know, to any duration, since this is an, ins an IRF, instant, uh, instant uh, impulse response function. So the first thing we do in this script is we use timing tool uh, and give it our, e e e, uh, our stimulus timing file. And timing tool will, will break this into events uh, sampled at, a, uh, at our upsampled TR of 0.1 seconds. So it's going to generate a time series of when this event was happening. When were the spiders shown? Cute or not, when, when were they displayed at a 0.1 second resolution? I will skip that step. Then we take the seed time series, we upsample it. Fantastic, you can imagine that. And then we, we use 3D T fitter to do it. So we take our upsampled seed time series and de uh, deconvolve it. So these big bold responses, not that we'll see any, but the big bold responses should become little neuronal responses in our two second box rather than in the 14 second time window. And now we can just multiply the, the spider time by this deconvolved seed and get uh, a spider seed. Multiply the, the 0, 1 puppy time by our deconvolved seed, 0, 1 puppy time multiplied by seed, and we get a zero, seed, a 0 puppy response seed time series. And then we can reconvolve these to see the above and beyond the main effect, we get a puppy time series and a seed time series in MRI time, in bold time, because we've reconvolved it. And that's what we do down here. And then we downsample them back to the normal TR and run our linear regression. That's enough. That, that's enough suffering with this. I am seeing tears. I, I hate to see people cry. So any, any last questions about this? It's OK to compare the neurons across days. I the runs in the same day, so. This, in the runs in the same day. Well, uh, in the same scanning session, yeah. yeah. So but if you have multiple runs, the, the deconvolution is, run, is done per run because, where's our deconvolution? Somewhere. Here we go. So for each run index, we run 3D T fitter. And that's because bold responses do not cross run breaks. So you don't want you don't want the run breaks infecting uh, the the deconvolution step. So you do it per run, and then then you can catenate later when you make your multi run regressor. Okay. Then in the end, when you generate the regressors, you concatenate them, but the book you run at three D convolve again. You you put you put these back in the full model with censoring, with motion, with pole lords, with the main regressors. So it's additional regressors in the main model. Mm -hmm. uh, Does this make a strong basis to then guess at unknown responses? So you establish traits of puppy versus spider, and then you get an unknown what did you see? It seems like the balance was confused. Yes. Yes, that was Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would think so. But only with getting the level of Yeah, so if you've got, uh, you know, multiple level, levels to some condition, you could use this as a way to guess at what the levels were for subjects. If, if that's what you mean. Yeah, that's right. Mm -hmm. Say that one more time, please. Do I have a final result? This, for example, you do TJC and you do 
Well, we, we should have results, except I didn't do one little thing. TCH, read me. Now, now we'll get results. That won't take terribly long, but uh, a few minutes. And that'll generate results that you'll have trouble understanding. <laughs> T-fitter? T-fitter uh, is, is it's, it's solving a potentially different equation. Uh, in, in, in 3DD Convolve, you're looking for a linear, uh, you're, you're looking for a linear combination of these regressors add up to fit to your data. In, in, it might be closer if you imagine uh, using 3DD Convolve with like 10 functions where you know when the events happened, but you don't know the shape of the response. And so you want to use 3D to involve to use N10 functions to generate uh, an IRF or, in, or uh, an HRF, because it's not impulse, it could be longer events, but some sort of model of the human di dynamic response function. In this case, it's different. We're assuming the response to any event is block shape. But we don't know when the events occurred exactly or how big the responses are. So we don't know when they occurred, but we're, we care about these time windows, but we don't know like the cuteness level. We don't know when these are happening in some sense. So it's, uh, 3D T-Fitter is looking for this in the data and converting this to a little bump and a bigger, a bigger this to a bigger bump at a different time. In some sense, you'd, you'd hope optimally this 14 second bold response would get mapped back to a two second bump, optimally. Because this is what happened and that's how long the stimulus lasted. Well, like oversampling is pretty much absent. Yeah, yeah. Just, just uh, putting more dots in the middle instead of dot, 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 dot. You know, having made in in this case 20, 20 per one, twenty uh, uh, oversampled points and 